Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And the wastelands of the Commonwealth presented to us in Fallout 4 are filled with no shortage of inexplainable happenings and strange mysteries that don't always make the most sense. Even much of what seems normal in this miserable world is later to be revealed as anything but embedding players with a natural instinct of skepticism. And as you can imagine, this has led to a widespread search for alternate explanations behind much of what exists in Boston's ruins. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. Sit back and relax as we take a look at five terrifying Fallout 4 theories. Starting off, what is easily one of the game's greatest mysteries is the Commonwealth's obvious overabundance of mannequins. All throughout Fallout 4 and its DLC, the sole survivor can stumble upon these plastic fossils of the Great War, in great numbers, often in areas they really don't belong. Furthermore, they're commonly found in, shall we say, abnormal, almost human and evil looking positions. And there's considerable reason to think that these mannequins have been demonstrating paranormal characteristics since even before the bombs fell. In Far Harbor, southeast of Fringe Cove docks, the player can find the ruins of a wrecked ship with evidence of this. Just a simple look around the vessel reveals these plastic statues in already incomprehensible positions. Most notable, a mannequin can be found standing over a skeleton of a ship worker holding a machete. Mind you, again, this is a shipwreck, i.e. underwater. So it would take a seriously dedicated group of twisted artists to set up a scene like this. No, these things are moving on their own. In this same wreckage, the sole survivor can uncover a note, seemingly written by the captain of this vessel prior to the war admits their voyage. It reads, quote, I can't wait to drop these damn mannequins off. The crew is starting to claim they're hearing weird noises from the cargo. Maybe they're playing pranks on me? Whatever, we're almost there. This makes everything even weirder, because if the mannequins have been acting with a minds of their own since at least 200 years ago, it suggests not even the Institute, the typical boogeyman Commonwealth Wastelanders attribute their problems to, could be responsible for this, and it's definitely paranormal. Well, this has led some to speculate that it's possible the mannequins could be under the possession of Ugg Quiltoth. There's no way I didn't mispronounce that. For those of you who don't know, Ugg Quiltoth is the Lovecraftian god that was secretly being worshipped at the Dunwich Boar's quarry site before the war. There is also an altar to this being at the Dunwich building in Fallout 3, and it's believed the Swamp Folk of Point Lookout also have some rituals dedicated to him. Interestingly, there's reason to suspect that this potential deity very much exists, at least in some capacity in the Fallout universe. During your time in the Dunwich Borers alone, you experience strange visions and flashbacks, as well as clearly hear rumbling footsteps. And there's even a strange statue found at the bottom of a tunnel that was being excavated that we really don't know anything about. Furthermore, it's clear this paranormal entity isn't exactly the most benevolent, as his followers are committing human human sacrifices in his name, per which what we again see at the Dunwich Boar's flashbacks. So with little else offering a satisfying justification for Fallout 4's mannequin happenings, the impression that perhaps this evil, and clearly somewhat real being has the power to and is possessing them, has fallen upon many. And if he's not, well then maybe that unknown possibility is even more frightening. Next on our list, Dogme is the lovable, playful, adorable German Shepherd puppy that provides the sole survivor with endless companionship and loyalty. Or is he? The conditions in which you first come across Dogme are certainly remarkable. Almost as soon as you leave Vault 111, right on the very road that leads away from it and Sanctuary, at the Red Rocket Truck Stop, what are the odds of a perfectly healthy, and even more significantly, friendly and well-trained dog would be waiting to attach itself to the first weirdo that came along? Astronomically low. Those are the odds. Nearly impossible. Think about it, this is a cruel, post-apocalyptic world. There's already very few dogs that are actually in a healthy, non-irradiated condition. And you would think, after obviously living as a stray for some time, dog meat would have grown vicious as a result of the nature of the Commonwealth. A coincidence with such an extraordinarily low chance of happening has led many to theorize that perhaps your meeting with dog meat wasn't by accident at all, but instead our four-legged friend was in fact the perfect spy for none other than the Institute. 
It's well documented that the Institute's Bioscience Lab have successfully been able to create animal-like synths, and it's not unreasonable to assume that perhaps Father had one deployed nearby Volt 111, in the form of a friendly German Shepherd. This companion could not only keep tabs on the player, but help the sole survivor get acquainted with this hostile new world. Quite frankly, the only other possible answer is lazy writing by Bethesda, which admittedly is something some of us are familiar with, but still, whatever the case, dog or synth, Dogmeat's still a good boy. Coming at number three, the children of Adam are, as is, a pretty shady and all-around mystery-shrouded organization. They view the Great War as something to be celebrated rather than mourned, that expanded the glow, the personification of their monotheistic god, affectionately named Adam. One character that dominates the religion of the Far Harbor chapter is a sort of mystical prophet that the children call the Mother. They claim that she's Adam's messenger to Earth, and is the one who led the children to the island in the first place, and appears rarely as a black silhouette. If you choose to join up with the Children of Adam, during the quest, Visions in the Fog, which serves as the player's initiation to the faction, you'll be instructed to drink from an irradiated water source called Adam Spring. After doing so, the player will begin to hallucinate, and you'll actually see a vision of the Mother herself who will instruct you to follow her and lead the sole survivor to a shrine before the vision concludes. Once you report back, your fellow children of Adam will explain the significance of your vision. They will assert that the mother only appears for the most worthy of individuals on extremely rare occasions. So you, you must be special. At this point, you'll probably be thinking one of two things. Either A, oh my god, I just saw a strange figure that correctly led me to a holy site. Maybe these children of Adam are onto something. Maybe their religion is the true one. Or you might just hold the opinion that this was all a silly coincidence, and perhaps many people just happened to share the same hallucination, or something. Well, it seems as though neither of these answers are correct, and the strange ghostly mother may in fact be a real person. Not a deity nor a prophet, but not a hallucination either, who simply made a clever use of stealth boys and has fooled the entire cult, according to one theory. West of Haddock Cove, and only a short walk away from the Spring of Adam, lies a variety of abandoned houses. And inside one of them, on the top floor, is a room clearly being lived in by someone with ties to the Children of Adam. But most significantly, on a table, are a variety of strange cryptic notes, each with phrases said by the ghostly figure to the player shortly after drinking from the spring. And underneath that table are none other than three stealth boys. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we found the dwelling of the being the Children of Adam call the Mother. Either that, or there's another crazy person in the Children of Adam, which honestly isn't all that inconceivable, but you get the idea. For fourth spot, Mama Murphy may in fact have a son, according to some. You see, Jared is the leader of a large raider gang, operating out of the Cor Vega assembly plant in Lexington. He and his entire gang are hostile, and offer no dialogue with the player. However, terminals left behind by Jared reveal he's been pursuing Mama Murphy for quite some time. In one entry titled Stumped, he remarks about an old woman from his childhood who had visions into his future, a clear reference to Mama Murphy's psychic ability called The Sight, who told Jared that the settlement they were in would be attacked, and he would be taken away and turned into a monster. Of course, that same entry reveals that all indeed did come true. As a young boy, he was kidnapped by raiders during an assault on the settlement he and Murphy lived in. Jared has since gone insane, searching for ways he could acquire powers similar to Mama Murphy's. He talks about slipping in and out of chem addiction, as he knows chems are what triggered her strange futuristic visions. Eventually, his terminal entries go on to tell tales about experimenting with subjects, and later on, there's one entry titled, She's Here, which states that some of his raiders believe they spotted Mama Murphy and Preston's gang nearby, and Jared has just ordered a detachment to pursue them. This is of course why we initially find Preston and the group under siege at the Museum of Freedom in Concord. Those raiders are trying to capture Mama Murphy. Many, however, are under the suspicion that perhaps Jared's infatuation with her blue jacket wearing friend subconsciously stems from mommy issues, and he's simply using the pursuit of her special power as an excuse to tell both himself and his fellow raiders. The power is sort of a way he can remember her by. It's never exactly elaborated on what his relationship with Mama Murphy was. She did come up and tell him that he had a very terrifying and dark future, I'd imagine you would only do that with a child you are extremely close to, i.e. a child. Either that or she's just accosting random children and telling them they would be kidnapped by raiders. The choice is yours. 
And finally, last on our list, the Volt 111 Mutiny was successful. Shortly after being unfrozen for the final time, as you walk around Volt 111, it's clear everyone has been long dead and something went terribly wrong. Skeletons dot the floors, and much of the structure has fallen into absolute disrepair. Terminal entries by both the Overseer and a security guard explain the precarious situation that likely led up to the Volt's eventual depopulation. Apparently 111 was never truly meant to house staff and security members much longer than 180 days after the bombs fell. It was expected that by then, vault Tech would issue an all-clear signal, and the crew would be able to exit the vault, scavenge supplies, and begin rebuilding the world. The cryopods within the structure would be managed remotely from there on out. However, no all-clear signal was ever received, and very quickly the staff ran out of food and supplies after the 180 days mark. The security guards demanded that the vault be open anyway, but the overseer refused, citing fears of radiation. The terminal entries finally end with a clear mutiny in progress. The Overseer has barricaded himself and the scientists in a section of the vault, while the armed security desperately attempts to escape. But it's left unclear which faction emerged out on top. Did the vault Tech guards finally break free? Or did they, as well as everyone else, simply starve to death? Well, some believe the vault Tech security guards did indeed manage to escape 111, and the remaining scientists and overseers simply perished due to starvation afterwards. There's a few good pieces of evidence that back this up. For one, in the present day, the entire Volt 111 compound has absolutely no remaining vault Tech security armor lying anywhere, you can't pick it up. As a matter of fact, Bethesda actually designed assets for a specific Volt 111 security helmet, but it was completely cut and removed from the game. Clearly, a lot of security equipment had to have been left in 111 before it was sealed. The only way it could have made it out is if the people using it also did. Furthermore, Brotherhood of Steel Knight Captain Barham is actually wearing an unequipable Volt 111 jumpsuit when you see his corpse during the quest, The Lost Patrol. He had to have gotten that from somewhere, though that could just be a glitch, as it's never really elaborated upon. And what of the Covenant Settlement? How did their residents get a hold of all that discolored vault Tech armor and vault Tech lab coats, as well as a copy of the GOAT test? Perhaps these 111 security guards did in fact manage to finally break free, and spread elements of their culture all across the Commonwealth. Whatever the case, I do hope they succeeded, as clearly those who remain in 111, either by choice or force, didn't have a very prosperous future ahead of them. But with that, we're going to wrap up. Five terrifying theories in Fallout 4. Which of the ones featured on this list made the most sense to you, or was the most interesting and fun to think about? And which ones would you like to try and debunk, and do you think you can disprove? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.